Now, we're going to see more about this family in chapter 5 when you see Lehi and Sariah come to the fore. But before we get there, we need to study chapter 3 and chapter 4. And I know this lesson is going long already, but we got we to spend time here. Okay? In these two chapters, we see the obtaining of the brass plates. Again, this is a book about getting books, right? And so the key text that we usually run to is in 1 Nephi chapter 3, verse 7. You probably have it memorized. That I, Nephi, will go and, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them, that they may accomplish the thing which he hath commanded them. Those are words to live by. And for us, I think our favorite part of the phrase is, I will go and do. It's this sense of commitment and conviction, and it's all going to work. I think we also love the promise that if the Lord's commanded it, then he will make a way, he'll prepare a way for us to accomplish it. That nothing, is, is there anything too, too hard for the Lord? Absolutely not, right? Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Thank you, Paul. I love that. But you know what's interesting? From dad's perspective, I think there was a different part of that verse that stood out to him. Because notice this detail. Two verses earlier in verse 5, Dad said to Nephi, Behold thy brothers murmur, saying, It is a hard thing which I have required of them. But behold, I have not required it of them, but it is a commandment of the Lord. Notice the difference there in verse 5. It's the difference between a divine command or a father's foolish imagination. And the problem with Laman and Lemuel, because they didn't understand God, they didn't understand Dad either. And they assumed that Dad's had another weird dream, and all of a sudden he's like book lonely, and here we are in the desert, and there's no library, so what, we got to go back and find some brass plates that's being held by Laban? Whatever, Dad. Why would you make us do this? So again, think about what, how that sounds in Lehi's ears, like, I'm not the one asking you. I'm not the one that said we got to pack up and leave. That was God. One of my close friends in my own ward today was my, his send-off. He works for the State Department, and he's heading off to Turkmenistan, if I remember correctly. And can you imagine your dad coming home and saying to the kids, they've got lots of little kids at home, and he's saying, hey, we're going to head off to Turkmenistan. And you're like, huh? Now, in his case, it wasn't his decision. It was the United States State Department. In Lehi's case, hey, kids, we're going to leave all the wealth that we've amassed. And we're going to go out into a wilderness in hopes that God keeps his promise that there's a promised land out there for us somewhere. Huh? What are you thinking, Dad? What did you eat before you went to bed last night? Yeah, foolish imaginations from a visionary man. Forget that epistemology. And yet, when Nephi comes to his dad and says, I will go and do the things that the Lord hath commanded. For I know that the Lord giveth no commandment unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way that we may accomplish the things which he hath commanded them. And it's those pronouns, it's that title of Lord that would have meant the most to Father Lehi. It's like, son, you get it. This isn't me. It's okay to ask questions like why. Why do we have to live this commandment? But it's even better to ask questions like who. Who's asking me to do it? As we're raising our children, hopefully we can teach the who behind every what. And that will help them with the why and move them towards the how. That was not the case with Laman and Lemuel. God wouldn't do that. It must be you. Why would you make us do this? And why do I have to follow my lunatic father? No. Where do the commandments really come from? Is Russell M. Nelson just a nice old man that's asking certain things that have crossed his mind? Or is he a prophet, seer, and revelator conveying commandments from God? Those are questions worth asking. Okay. Nephi gets it, and dad is rejoicing as a result. So he decides, oh, hey, we're going to go, and he brings his brothers with him. Now they head back to Jerusalem. This would have been a long journey to get back. We don't know exactly how t the time frame, but the t time to go back, the time these three different attempts to get the plates to come back in the wilderness, this could have been a month that they were gone. 
So no wonder mom is distraught by the time he gets to chapter 5. But still in chapter 3, there are three different rounds of attempts. And I'm just going to fly through these because this is a very famous story. The first time, they consult one with another. And that's not bad because they're, at least they're counseling with their counsels, as Elder Ballard used, we used to say. And so let's talk about this. Let's figure it out. But then they end up casting lots, which sounds a lot like just, well, roll the die or pull the straw or do something. And we're going to trust this to fate. Now, talking about things and then just kind of leaving it to chance yeah, might not end up the best way. Now, we have to be careful here because if it's just rolling the dice and it's, or flipping the coin and it's 50-50 or we're going to do rock, paper, scissors or whatever it is, are we trusting fate? Are we trusting blind luck? Or are we trusting God in a way that was true to the time period? Because there are examples in the Bible where they would cast lots on certain things. And it was almost a way to allow God to manifest his will in some visible way. And that could actually work, they believed. Sometimes I'm sure it did. But the interesting thing about that is you really are leaving it to God 100%. Or, again, in the absence of God's participation, you are leaving it to luck. There may be times where God's totally fine with the coin toss, with, with the coin toss, excuse me. It may be when he says, well, go north, south, east, or west. It mattereth not. You cannot go on this, right? Then, you know, sure, just spin the spinner and wherever it's pointing, head in that direction. Cast a lot. You can't go wrong. Every possibility is equally good as far as I'm concerned. So go with it. But in this family, can you imagine the four different possibilities? Either Laman's going to go, or Lemuel's going to go, or Sam's going to go, or Nephi's going to go. And of those four, what do you think is the ideal outcome? Well, I hope cast the lot and it falls on Nephi. He's the one that has faith. He's going to make this happen. But who does the lot fall on in round number one? You guessed it. Laman. The worst possible outcome. Are you willing to chance it when there's a differentiation between outcomes? And one that you would never choose if it was left up to you. I mean, do some homework here, boys. Again, glad you started counseling. But then don't just leave it to the fates. They go, Laman, it falls on Laman, he goes, what does it say he did? What's his approach? It says he talked with Laban. And can you imagine trying to fill in the, model, the dialogue for that one? It's like, yeah, my crazy dad ate something weird and he had a dream that we had to come get these brass plates from you. Is that okay? And you really think Laban's going to go for that? No, again, you're trusting things to a worst possible scenario outcome at worst. And sure enough, the worst happened. Laban is so outraged by this that he sends his troops. He call, first of all, he calls, Laban, or calls Laman a thief. Like, you came to steal it, which was totally not the case. I was like, I'm asking for it. We talked about, we're talking about this. And then he sends his troops to go kill him. Now, Laman outruns them. He takes off, comes back to his brothers, and, and he's mad. But not as mad as he's going to be. <laughs> Because second attempt, here's Nephi. They're all sad about it, and he, but yet he's determined. I love his language. He's like, no, as long as, as the Lord liveth, we will not go down. We're not going down. We're not going back to the wilderness. We're not going back to our dad empty-handed. God made the command. God will provide a way. In fact, maybe he already has. He told us, he told dad to leave all of our wealth. And there was a lot of it. I, sorry to bring up a painful subject, layman. But your so-called inheritance... It's all still here. So let's gather it. And if, if a free gift from Laban feels like a theft on, from him, for him, then let's buy it. And we, we'll make him an offer he can't refuse. He can have all our stuff. All we want is that one book from you. So if the first time was placing their trust in luck or fate, the second time is placing their faith in the arm of flesh. Temporal things, worldly wealth, of course, with money, we can buy just about anything we want. So they try it that way. And how does Laban respond? Covetously. He must have been pretty wealthy himself, but he's so awed by this wealth, and he sees an easy way to get it, that he sends his, serv his soldiers after this family of brothers. And I love the way Nephi puts it. This language is hilarious. 
Verse 26, it came to pass that we did flee before the servants of Laban, and we were obliged to leave behind our property. And it fell into the hands of Laban. Think about the word obliged and the word fell. This is so calm compared to Laban's violent anger. It's so kind of take it or leave it, easy come, easy go. I mean, we were, here we are sprinting away for our very lives, and we were obliged, <laughs> yeah, I mean, forced at the point of a spear, basically. We were obliged to leave behind our wealth. And, oh, I wonder what happened to it. Well, I'm sure it just uh, fell into the hands of Laban. Now, it's then that Laman is absolutely livid to the point of beating his brother with a stick until an angel had to come and break up the fight. You know that part of the story. But what amazes me here, again, is, first of all, Laman must have been banking on getting it back. It's like dad left the land of our inheritance, but okay, fine, get them and my other brothers out of the picture. All I have to do is go back. It's all right there. It's not like we've locked it up. People are going to know we were getting out of town. No, we just kind of left it like we were I kind of gone for the weekend, but it's all right there waiting for me to go back and get not just my double portion, but the whole thing. But now it's gone and gone for good. And can you imagine how furious he is? Because now the only positive future he envisioned is, has gone up in smoke. As opposed to Nephi's language, which shows that we didn't lose any of it. I mean, sure, it fell into his hands, but I, I left it the first time. As far as I was concerned, it was God's gold and silver by then. And if he wanted to use it to buy the plates, great. We're not, we're not going to do anything with it. It does us no good in the wilderness. You understand? I love the fact that Nephi had already made the sacrifice. And so it didn't feel like a sacrifice the second time. You with me? Well, again, that didn't, that didn't work. The angel comes, break up, breaks up the fight, promises them success. Remember that detail when you get there. Promises it's going to work. And as soon as the angel leaves, Laman and Lemuel are back to their murmuring ways. But how? In fact, that's the word they use in verse 31. How is it possible that the Lord will deliver Laban into our hands? Behold, he is a mighty man, and he can command 50. Yea, even he can slay 50. Why not us? Again, they're not asking the right question. Here they're asking how. How's he going to do it? I want to know logistics. When they should have been asking who. And that was an answer they already had. God will deliver him into your hands. Now, Nephi himself was no more clued in to how it was the logistics than his older brothers were. He didn't understand it either, but he trusted. And so when chapter three turns to chapter four, I love Nephi's initial words. When they're asking, how is it even possible this could, that he could do it? Nephi says, God is mightier than all the earth. Then why not mightier than Laban and his 50? <laughs> or even his tens of thousands. Numbers are not the issue here. Therefore, let us go up, let us be strong like unto Moses. For he truly spake unto the waters of the Red Sea, and they divided hither and thither. And our fathers came through, out of captivity, on dry ground. And the armies of Pharaoh did follow and were drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. Now behold, ye know that this is true. See, he's, he's appealing to their testimony of the Israelite past. Ye also know that an angel hath spoken unto us. So now he's appealing to their personal spiritual experience. Wherefore can ye doubt? Is the question he leaves them with. And I love that one. Wherefore means why. Why are you still doubtful when your own experience tells you otherwise? When scripture tells you otherwise? I love this passage because it helps us see how Nephi studies the scriptures. And how he tries to live them. Because notice what he, says, what he says at the end. Let us go up. The Lord is able to deliver us, even as our fathers, and to destroy Laban, even as the Egyptians. Remember when you took the SAT or the ACT and there were those analogies you had to fill in? Dog is to puppy as cat is to kitten. And you're establishing relationships here. Well, fill out this one. Laban is to the Egyptians as we are to, come on, Laban, you can do this our fathers. And God is to God, since he hasn't changed. The same God that brought our fathers out of the Egyptian hand, out of Pharaoh, from underneath Pharaoh's thumb. He can save us from this local Laban, as Elder Maxwell used to call him. That's all he is, just a local Laban. 
This is no Pharaoh. So he can com command 50? That doesn't scare God at all. God has some interesting military victories under his belt. And if he can do that for Moses, why can't he do it with us? Come on, wherefore can ye doubt? That's good scripture study. In some ways, our job this year and every year as we study scripture is to stockpile principles like this one. God delivers the righteous from the hands of the wicked. How many examples of that can you see? David with Goliath. Elisha and with all of the armies of Israel, the, the chariots of fire against the hosts of the enemy. Moses and Pharaoh. The, there are so many examples. And Nephi knew he would be one as well. That's good scripture study. Okay, cloud of witnesses. In some ways, the real question we should ask in any given circumstance is, which scriptural story am I living right now? Because I know it's the same God in both instances. It's just a matter of knowing how I'm supposed to respond to the situation I'm in. Okay? Well, the third time is the charm here. And it's the third time, this beautiful verse, chapter 4, verse 6, where Nephi says, I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. So, I don't know what the future holds, other than victory. Uh, I will go and do the things. I know the Lord will prepare a way. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but I'm not worried about the how. I've got the who, and that's all I need right now. So he goes forward. It's actually interesting if you look at the details, because his brothers, are, well, Laman and Lemuel, are still grumbling. They're still murmuring. And so, but they, but they they accompany him. But one interesting detail is that when they get to the wall of the city, Nephi leaves them there. It's like, hey, thanks for coming, but I think it's best if it's just me and God going forward. This totally reminds me of Jesus when he raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead. Remember that story, when he leaves the the crowd of mourners outside because they have doubt. And no doubt allowed inside the room where a miracle has to happen. Only faith allowed inside. So mom, dad, you've got it. Peter, James, John, you've got it. At least you better. And I know I've got it. And so it's the faithful that are allowed entrance to behold the miracle. In fact, to help it come forth. So there's, in this occasion, similarly, Nephi is saying, if you're only coming begrudgingly, and grumblingly, then it's not going to do us any good. Why don't you stay here outside the wall, and I'll bring my faith in with me. Now, he goes, and it's here that one of the worst opening stories of the Book of Mormon occurs. Because as you know, hopefully no spoiler alert needed here, Nephi ends up slaying Laban to be able to obtain the plates. And all of a sudden, you have a homicide four chapters into this text that's supposed to be scripture from God. On my mission, one woman made it painfully clear when we came back after a first discussion that was like she was on fire, so excited to study the Book of Mormon. We came back for the second discussion, expecting her to be an Alma or something already. And she just handed us the book back and said, take it. I know it's not true. And I'm like, whoa, what? Really? What did you read? And she said, I got through the first four chapters. And then it dawned on me. Oh, okay, yeah. Let me guess. You're mad that Nephi killed Laban. And she's like, duh, of course. And the fact that God told him to, that makes it all the worse. The same God that said thou shalt not kill is now all of a sudden commanding murder? No way. I guess your old Joe Smith forgot about the sixth commandment when he made up the Book of Mormon. No, I'm sticking with thou shalt not kill. I was at a loss, like, okay, um, actually at first I wasn't at a loss. I thought, okay, I've talked to people about this before. I've thought about it through myself. This is fine. And I just looked at her and said, oh yeah, what about Abraham and Isaac? There's an example of God commanding a homicide. In fact, an infanticide, your own, your own son. And then she responded, yeah. But then he stopped him. I'm like, oh, touche. You're right. Okay. Bad example. Um, ooh, layman. Uh, no, no, uh, how about David and Goliath? There you go. Because David did end up killing Goliath. And God said he was still a man after his own heart, chosen to be king. And she said, fine. 
but that was war and that's different. I'm like, oh, dang it. So there I was, um, strike one, strike two. What do I do now? Well, as a young missionary, I just turned to my trainer and he looked back and kind of shrugged. And I'm like, great. Um, what do I do? And it was so interesting because it was one of those moments where it was, open your mouth and it shall be filled. And I'm like, I've opened my mouth twice and it's been filled with her rebuttal both times. I don't know what else to say here. Um, actually, something popped in my head. I said, oh, it actually says it right there in the text. The Lord himself says, better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Laban was in their way and had to be moved out of the way so they could obtain the plates. Okay? God said so. And she said, there are so many other ways that Laban could be moved out of the way than murder. In fact, if Laban needed to die, fine, let God do it. God's the one in charge of life and death. It's not going to make somebody else do something like that. And then I really was done. Okay, well, that's it. Do you have any neighbors that don't have any, wouldn't have any problems with uh, the homicide in First Nephi chapter 4 that we could share this story with? Uh, where this wasn't going anywhere. But again, open your mouth, it shall be filled. I'm like, it's been filled with my foot. This isn't working. Just try again. So I found myself saying to the sweet woman, um, yeah, you're mad at Nephi, huh? You think he's committed murder, and so you want to put him on trial. Okay, let's do it. Let's put Nephi on trial. And my companion's like, huh? What are you, what are you doing here? I'm like, I don't know. Um, but don't forget, it's 600 BC, so this would be a Mosaic law court. A court of Mosaic law. And it's in that law that you already quoted it, thou shalt not kill. And yeah, I guess Nephi is going to have to answer for that. But actually, can we bring Laban to the stand first? Because doesn't he have some stuff to answer for? I mean, he threatened Laman with death. Then later he sent his servants to kill all four of those boys. Are we up to five counts of attempted murder? And if this is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life, death for death, then has he chalked up five death penalties on himself by the way he's treated them? And that was only the sixth commandment. What about thou shalt not steal? That's the eighth commandment, because uh, he stole all their stuff. Now, I don't think that brought the death penalty, but still, we're racking up some charges against Laban here. Oh, and then there's the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet, and man, he wanted all their stuff. That's why he stole it in the first place. And actually, there's even this weird uh, commandment or law in the law of Moses, 600 BC, and we're sticking in court, right? Take God completely out of the picture, and just Nephi's there in court, um, there's this interesting one in the Law of Moses that says, if you falsely accuse somebody else, then whatever punishment you were going to inflict on them comes back and is inflicted on you. It was a great way to avoid whistleblowers that were false. There's no false accusation allowed in ancient Israel. And to scare off false accusers, it's like, okay, if you're making something up and, and we find out, it's going to come back to bite you. Now, again, think about that first instance. What does he say to Laman? You're a robber. And that wasn't the case. He hadn't come to steal anything. And what was he going to do? And I will slay you. Ooh, so that death threat is, has to come back to bite Laban. And according to the Old Testament, Law of Moses, 600 B.C. court, who executes the judgment? The witnesses do. And that's exactly what Nephi was. So I guess you could take God completely out of the picture, just drag Nephi towards the court, and most likely he would get off scot-free, not for committing homicide, but for executing justice according to the law of his time. And this woman sat there listening and then said, can I have my book back? I'm like, sure, here it is. And she was ready to keep on reading. Well, we finished the discussion and left. And I remember my companion looking at me as we were walking out of the street, just going, oh. and I was looking up as we were walking out of the street going, oh. because he was like, Halverson, where did you get all of that? And I'm like, I have no idea. I, I didn't know any of that stuff before we started. I was, I was just excited to find out what I was going to say next. And it just kept coming. Now, granted, I had read the Old Testament before my mission. 
So it was in there somewhere, the deep recesses. But what's that verse? Take no thought beforehand, but treasure up continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very moment, that portion that shall be meted to every man. That happened to me that day. I since have studied a lot more about this story, and there's all kinds of beautiful scholarship about the legalistic treatment of what's happening here. Uh, Jack Welch, John W. Welch, a great, amazing legal professor, law professor at BYU, and an amazing scholar of the Book of Mormon, has written a great article on the, legal as the legalistic aspects of, of this story. And there's all kinds of other interesting scholarship that's been written about it, because it is a troubling story, believe me. Uh, Elder Holland has written about this. Uh, Millet and McConkie have written about this. Uh, there's actually a beautiful, more recent article by Charles Swift where he takes a much closer read of the whole story and points out some fascinating details that I'd always missed. I'll show you a few as we go through, and again, we'll have to be fairly brief here. But look at verse 10 of chapter 4. It came to pass that I was constrained by the Spirit that I should kill Laban. That's the very first thing. We don't know the dialogue. We don't know exactly what the Spirit said yet, but some kind of constraint placed on him. And in the 1828 dictionary, constrain means to urge irresistibly or powerfully, to compel, to force. And it says there that Nephi shrunk at that command. He said, I, I said in my heart, never at any time have I shed the blood of man, and I shrunk and would that I might not slay him. That shrinking word is an interesting one because that's the word that Jesus himself uses to describe Gethsemane. He wanted to shrink from what seemed like an impossible command from his father. I, there's no way I can do what you are constraining me to do. And that constraint is, suggests there's no other option here. And so here's Nephi caught between a rock and a hard place. Caught between his own feelings of morality that are defined by thou shalt not kill. I've never shed the blood of any man. And I'm large in stature. But I've never used that to hurt anyone else. But that's caught against the same God who is saying in this moment, you must. In verse 11, the Spirit said unto me again, and this is one of the things I'm so grateful that Charles Swift pointed out, because if he's saying it again, now we see what he said the first time. And here's the quote, Behold, the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. Put that in quotation marks. And now you know what God is saying repeatedly, what the Spirit has conveyed and now we're back in Nephi's head. Yea, I also knew, but this is Nephi. This is Nephi thinking out loud in, our, in this case, or on the paper, on the page, on the plate. But God simply said, I've delivered him into your hands. And so, yes, you're, you've got to kill him. You're constrained to that. Now, Nephi is starting to make sense of it. He's trying to, I would not call this rationalizing, but I'm trying to make sense of why God would say this. I knew that he had sought to take away mine own life. That's the death penalty on his part, right? Yea, and he would not hearken unto the commandments of the Lord. And then another one, he had also taken away our property. So it's in that moment that Nephi starts running through this court case like I just described. But that wasn't the Lord saying it. It wasn't God saying, this is all justified. This is you doing justice according to the law of your day. That's Nephi trying to make sense of why on earth would God say this? How, how could this ever be possible? But then verse 12, It came to pass that the Spirit said unto me again, Slay him, for the Lord hath delivered him into thy hands. That's it. Here's the commandment. God has placed this man in your path for you to do this act. In fact, to do it on my behalf. Because notice what the Lord then explains. Or excuse me, what the Spirit explains. Behold, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. After all, here's the explanation. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Now, this isn't just some kind of moral calculus being tabulated. And like, ah, oh, well, one down. Nations that will grow out of this will be blessed by the word of God in Scripture. It's simply a judgment on God's part where he says, the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth his righteous purposes. 
And with that statement, without having to list all the commandments that Laban broke, God has passed judgment upon this man that's lying drunk in the street. This is far from premeditated murder. Nephi doesn't want to have anything to do with it. But he's been given a commandment by a God of judgment and justice. And when the, when God, when the Spirit says to him, the Lord slayeth the wicked, I can picture Nephi saying, then yeah, let him do it. And the Spirit saying, what do you think he's trying to do through you? Nephi, what did you say when you were talking to your dad before coming on this journey? That commandments come from God? Did you mean that? That you'll do whatever the Lord commands? Did you mean that too? That the Lord will provide a way for you to accomplish the things that He commands you to do? Was that all bluff and bluster? Or do you mean it? I wonder, there seems to be something here about God almost calling Nephi's bluff to see if it was one. Will you obey me no matter what? The real test of morality is to do what God tells you to do. Now, this is not, to meant, this is not meant to justify anyone who claims divine you know, command to do the unthinkable. In Nephi's case, he knew God. He had already been visited by him. He had the Spirit soften his heart. He knew he had a relationship. This is Abraham and Isaac. Do the impossible because I command. And remember, Abraham did not expect his hand to be stayed. He fully intended to go through with what God had commanded him to do. So did Nephi. When he finally realized that, and yes, this is a, a test of my obedience unlike anything I've ever experienced, then what am I going to do? Verse 17 and 18, I knew that the Lord had delivered Laban into my hands for this cause, that I might obtain the records according to his commandments. Now, he talked himself through that the previous couple of verses. He's like, okay, we have to have the commandments of God. I know that. This is all about obedience. That's what it boils down to. Oh, darn it. Uh, how does this, uh, this test of obedience to this level? But if obedience is what matters most, and by the way, please keep an eye on that from this moment forward through First and Second Nephi. Nephi defines himself by obedience to God. It's in, among his last words at the end of 2 Nephi. Pay it, keep an eye out for obedience throughout Nephi's entire minute, life and ministry. You'll see it everywhere. And here God's calling him on it. And then as he's trying to wrap his head around this and work his way through it, he realizes, well, we have to all keep the commandments. The commandments are written upon the brass plates. We can't keep commandments we don't know about. And so my posterity will have to have the scriptures to reveal the commandments so they know how they have to live their lives. This whole story is about obedience. And now it, the sticking point is me keeping this impossible, unthinkable commandment from God. But I know it comes from Him. Forget Jewish law. That's not why we're doing it. Because that would not be a test of faith or obedience on my part. It would simply be justice doing its due. <sighs> okay. Therefore, I did obey the voice of the Spirit. I took Laban by the hair of the head, and I smote off his head with his own sword. And can you sense Nephi's shudder of the soul? Can you imagine... From that moment on, every time he opened the brass plates to copy a passage from Isaiah, for example, he would be haunted by a dark alley somewhere in the streets of Jerusalem with a sword in one hand and a fistful of hair on the other and trembling nerve, but clenched teeth and white knuckles, and will I do what God has commanded of me? Or will I shrink? Can you think of another son of God 
facing the unimaginable and trembling, white knuckled in the garden, wondering if he can keep God's impossible command or if he must shrink from it. And how does the Lord introduce himself when the risen Lord comes to the Nephites? I'm the one that obeys my father's command. That's how Nephi is going to define himself from this moment on as well. That's how Elder Holland deals with this whole story too. It's really fascinating to understand where he's coming from. Like I said, so many scholars have wrestled with from so many different perspectives. But the simplest explanation might be the most accurate, which is simply obey Nephi. You know the who. And that's what matters. I'm amazed by him. I'm amazed by the aftermath. As then, again, I know not what, I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand what I should do. Well, okay, now I did that. What, what's the next step? Well, go get the plates. And I wonder how much of this is God continuing to walk him through it, or now it's, it's on you, or figure this out. But he dresses in Laban's clothing. He goes and finds the, his servant, Zoram. You've got the keys to the treasury. Take me there. I want the brass plates. I need to take them to my brethren outside the walls. And Zoram is like, your brother? Oh, the brothers of the Jews. Okay, yeah, they want their scriptures too. Sounds good. And he goes. It's actually interesting detail that what is it about Nephi in disguise that convinces Zoram that it's okay? It says he recognized his master's garments and his master's sword. Again, one of the great things about Scripture is these layers and levels of symbolism that can be attached to different things. I mean, even that phrase, better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. Does that sound like the atonement to you? Better that one man, one son of man of holiness should perish than that every nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief, in iniquity, in unworthiness. I see Jesus in that verse too. But to recognize your master by the garments he wears and the sword that he wields. How will we recognize Christ? Oh, by his robes of righteousness. And by the sword of the spirit and word that he wields so well. In return, how will he recognize us? What are we wearing? Is our wedding garment on? What are we wielding? Do we know the word? Do we have the spirit? There's, I don't know, something beautiful to me about that. And then the, the rest of the story, and I'll just throw this out quickly. One year, I was doing a combo sequential topical study. I was about to get married. So I wanted to read the entire Book of Mormon looking for marriage lessons. And the first one I found was here in chapter 4, from Nephi and Zoram, of all, of all people. What was my lesson? If she runs, tackle her. No, no, that was not it. I'm kidding. The lesson was, notice the words. When you read the end of chapter 4, keep an eye out because you have two perfect strangers that are about to start a journey together. Sound like marriage? Basically. Yeah, you're heading off to a wilderness of the unknown in hopes of arriving at a promised land someday. But there's a lot of tension, confusion, doubt, fear on both parties. That's why Nephi had to kind of hold him there for a second. But then there's this conversation that ensues. And when you read it, look for covenant language. It's so beautiful. It talks about oaths, covenants, promises being made. And when Nephi promises Zoram, come with us and you'll be a free man. Nobody's servant. Equal partners in this journey. One of us. You're nobody's second class. You're no second class citizen. You're no servant you're on equal, you're equal partners here. And because of that promise, it says that Zoram's heart took courage. And then Zoram made a promise in return. I promise I'll go with you. I'm not going to run back and report you to the authorities. And then it says that because of Zoram's oath, Nephi and his brothers, their fears ceased concerning him. And I remember feeling like that was such a gift as I began my Book of Mormon study of marriage. As the Lord revealed, if you're nervous about starting a marriage, if you two strangers don't know how you're going to make it through this wilderness journey, then trust in covenant. 
Trust in the power of your promises and your hearts will take courage and your fears will cease. And that's exactly how our, my wife and I began our marriage and have been living it ever since. Trusting in the power of promise. Covenant. Beautiful. Thank you, Zoram and Nephi, for teaching me that. And then one last short little chapter we'll have to do briefly. I know we've gone double time today. I'm sorry, not sorry. I'll, I'll keep trying. But in chapter 5, you meet Sariah. We saw her before, just briefly mentioned by Nephi, but here she plays a, a starring role, and it's, it's in sorrow. She is devastated because it's been all this time that's passed, and what's become of my sons, and the catastrophizing that Laman and Lemuel were guilty of, she starts feeling too. And I can't blame her. I'm not trying to throw Sariah under the bus here. She's gotten to her breaking point. We're going to see, ne we're going to see Lehi's breaking point in chapter 16. He's got one too. So hold out for it. But at this point, what is Sariah's breaking point? The loss of her sons. Sounds like a mother heart to me. But what's interesting here is that she tends to take it out on her husband. And trials can do that in the best of marriages. When something is going wrong, some hard tribulation, adversity, sometimes husband and wife approach it from two different angles, and as a result, they see the other party across from themselves, hovering over the problem, as if they were the source. We're not, we're, we're not seeing eye to eye on this. We're looking at the problem and seeing the other person standing behind it, and that go, can go both ways. You can't, in, a, in a marriage, you cannot let the trial come between you. You've got to stay on the same side, looking at it. There'll be a little bit different angle, and that's important. But men and women coming together to see it in 3D, right? Proper depth perception. But don't let it become between you. Both of you can approach this with faith in God and faith in each other's best, best interest. Okay? So notice how it happens in chapter 5. At the end of verse 1, it says that she had mourned because of us. She's already suffering through the funeral, okay? She, she thinks they're gone. Notice the next verse. For she had supposed that we had perished in the wilderness. There's that catastrophizing I mentioned a moment ago. She had also complained against my father, telling him that he was a visionary man. So, unfortunately, saying the same thing that Laman and Lemuel had been thinking themselves. And to complain against him, and then pay close attention to the pronouns she uses. Behold, thou, you, thou, not God, thou hast led us forth from the land of our inheritance. It's sad that in her worst moment, she morphs into layman. It's our inheritance. We've left it behind. I can't believe I went along with this crazy idea. You visionary man, why did you have to say that? Dreamer? And now our sons are dead because I listened to you? Notice she says, we've left the land of our inheritance. That's the plural pronoun. We both lost a bunch of stuff, but my sons are no more. And we perish in the wilderness. So I'm with you in losing all that we have. I'm with you in dying here alongside you. But those were my boys. My sons are no more. And after this manner of language had my mother complained against my father. Like I said, I, I, think, I do not think less of Sariah at all in this moment. There's such raw reality here. This is mama bear coming out. And I've seen mama bear come out of my wife towards me when we were approaching difficult challenges from different perspectives. That's why I've learned we can't let it become against one another. We got to stay on the same side. But it's so interesting to complain about visionary people. If you aren't that type and you just can't understand why anyone would do something without some empirically provable point. As a kid once, my mom said, said to me, son, I know you wanted to have a sleepover with a friend so you could go out in toilet paper. My mom actually had no problem with us toilet paper. It was a kinder, gentler day back then. I mean, we were donating toilet paper to people. During COVID, that would have been a blessing, right? I mean, she'd drive the getaway vehicle half the time. It was totally fine. But for some reason that night, she said, I, I don't want you to have a friend over and I don't want you guys to toilet paper. And I was like, well, why? That's the age old question for a child, right? I was an early teenager, probably in junior high. Like, come on, mom, why? You're usually fine with it. She said, I know, but 
I don't know. Tonight, I don't feel good about it. And inside, I'm all, oh, you don't feel good about it. I've got a visionary mother, and the foolish imaginations of her heart are keeping me from having fun. Come on, whatever. So I pretended to be the obedient, dutiful son. I said, okay, thank you, Mom. Uh, of course, I'll just stay here. And I did stay there for a while until I snuck out of my window and had planned it all out with my friend. And we met up in the middle of the night and ran down to the grocery store and bought our toilet paper. I don't know why they sell teenagers toilet paper in, at midnight and beyond. But we headed off to go have our fun. And there in the shadows of kind of these back roads and the paseos they were called, these little sidewalks that connect to different parts of the neighborhoods, we got jumped by a couple of drunk college students. And to see my buddy get beaten in the face as I stood just scared to death in the, in the bushes until the girlfriends of these drunk guys calmed them down and said, they're just kids, leave them alone. What? And then me to try to stop my friend's mouth from bleeding and realizing that I need help with this. It's scary to get jumped when you're in junior high. And especially when we lived closest to the scene of the crime, it's a horrible feeling to ring your own doorbell at 1 a.m. and let your mom know that you weren't home like you said you would be. Because you didn't trust the feeling of a visionary woman. Sorry, mom. For us to learn to value the spiritual gifts of other people, to trust in someone else's divine connection Instead of demanding, like Layman did, how? How's God going to do this? Instead of expecting, come on, honey, you didn't have any good reason for us to leave everything. And now my sons are dead. My sons. And how does, how does Lehi respond? This is the part that blows me away. When my wife ever reaches her breaking point, I can only pray I'll be a Lehi for her. Because what does Lehi say? Verse 4, came to pass that my father spake unto her, saying, I know. I know that I am a visionary man. Which is the long way of saying, you're right, honey. <laughs> Just to, again, I don't want to be on opposite sides of this. So if you're looking at it from that angle, I am too. Let me come around the table and sit right alongside you. Let me put my arm around you so we're looking at the same thing from the same angle. You are completely correct, honey. I am a visionary man. Guilty as charged, but let me tell you why that's such a good thing. For if I had not seen the things of God in a vision, I should not have known the goodness of God, but had tarried at Jerusalem and had perished with my brethren. Interesting, he still refers to his old persecutors as his brethren. He didn't think he was any better than they were, but he knew that obedience was required of him, which is why he left. It was his goodness. Even if you go back to 1 Nephi and see some of his praise when he has the vision and reads the book, he praises God for his justice right alongside his mercy. There's something powerful about his perception of God. It's amazing. But here, what else does he say to his distraught wife? I love this. But behold, I have obtained a land of promise. Notice the verb tense there. I have obtained it. What? We're only a couple weeks or a month out of Jerusalem. We're so far away from the promised land. It's years from now. She doesn't know that yet. Neither does he. But he, as far as he's concerned, done deal. I have obtained the land of promise. Faith allows us to speak of the future in the past tense. That's incredible. Talk about a positive attitude in the present because of his faith in the future. He says, in the which things I do rejoice. So I, I can already celebrate present attitude because of future promise that I can now treat as if it were past. Yea, I know. How's here's this for his testimony? I know that the Lord will deliver my sons out of the hands of Laban. Now catch the verb tense there. Will deliver. Hasn't happened yet as far as I know. We have no evidence yet, but I know it will come. But I'm not going to wait for proof to justify my positive attitude. 
I'm going to experience joy in the meantime because I know what God will do. For who? Not just your sons, my sons. They're mine as much as they are yours, honey. I'm, on, I'm with you on this. So my sons, don't forget that I care about them as much as you do, even if we have different perspectives or approaches in raising them. They're my boys too. And God will deliver my sons out of the hands of Laban and bring them down again unto us in the wilderness. So he took her my, countered it with his my, and ended it with an us. We're in this together, honey. And I'm sorry it's been so hard for you. But please, believe. What's amazing here is the next two verses, notice 6 and 7. After this manner of language did my father Lehi comfort my mother Sariah concerning us. While we journeyed in the wilderness up to the land of Jerusalem to obtain the record of the Jews. And when we had returned to the tent of my father, however long that took, However much time passed between verse 6 and 7, I don't know. But when we finally returned, behold, their joy was full, and my mother was comforted. Did you see the repetition of the word comfort? In verse 6, it was a comfort of something yet to come. In verse 7, it was comfort fulfilled, because the boys were back. I, I love that she was willing to be comforted to a certain point at least, <laughs> because of her, her husband's faith. And that can be comforting. Hopefully it's just enough comfort to get us through until the ultimate comfort finally comes, when the promise is finally fulfilled. We can hold on to both kinds of comfort as well. And then notice what she says in verse 8. She spake saying, now I know. You kept saying, I know before. Well, now I know after. Maybe she's a little more like Sam, that I didn't, it was hard for, I, I was a good Sam when I left Jerusalem. Okay, I'm not going to complain. I know we're leaving all these things behind and life in the wilderness is going to be different for a mother than for a father. This is going to be hard, but I went along with it, trusting you. Well, I guess at some point it's not enough to trust in somebody else's words. I had to know for myself and now she does. Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath commanded my husband to flee into the wilderness. This wasn't his idea. It wasn't his visionary dream. This was God. Yea, I also know of a surety, that was that same strong testimony, that the Lord hath protected my sons. It wasn't just Nephi's oh, street smarts. God is behind all of this. She has come to know him through her extremity. So God, the Lord, hath protected my sons and delivered them out of the hands of Laban and given them power whereby they could accomplish the thing which the Lord hath commanded them. This is mom's version of 1 Nephi 3.7. Almost exactly the way Nephi said it. Mom is now saying it in her own words. And she's recognizing that God's behind it all. It's not my crazy husband. <laughs> this is exactly the life the Lord would have us lead. And so I'll take it. Now, my friends, the way it, it goes from there, the end of chapter 5, <laughs> in some ways it seems like stereotypical mom and dad. Mom, so concerned about the children. Anytime I missed curfew, mom was always the one that was freaking out, and dad was like, ah, oh, they'll be fine. Yeah, it's kind of that way with my wife and I as well. And <laughs> while mom is so freaking out about the sons, as soon as they come back and she's comforted and she's rejoicing and her joy is full, it's like, yes, my boys. And she just picture her falling, them, falling all over them, kissing them. Whereas dad's like, boys, good to see you. Where's the book? Where's the plates? It's like, I knew you'd come back. The question is, do you have the plates that I sent you there for? Or excuse me, that God sent you there for? That's what I want. And it says that as soon as he got his hands on them, he did search them from the beginning. Can you picture him pouring over the pages of the brass plates? learning about creation and fall, Israelite history, prophecy of prophets, all the way up to Jeremiah's day. I mean, they kept this stuff up to date. It's amazing what was on there. But then notice the final words regarding it. This is the end of chapter 5. Look at verse 20 through 22. We'll end here. And it came to pass that thus far I and my father had kept the commandments wherewith the Lord had commanded us. 
You see, it always comes back to obedience for this, this father and this son. We've kept the commandments. The Lord was the source behind them. We had obtained the records which the Lord had commanded us. There's that word again. And searched them and found that they were desirable. Yea, even of great worth unto us. Insomuch that we could preserve the commandments of the Lord unto our children. Wherefore, and here's Nephi's final takeaway. It was wisdom in the Lord that we should carry them with us as we journeyed in the wilderness towards the land of promise. This is a perfect conclusion to this part of the story. These preliminary pages of the Book of Mormon. You got a book in hand. What do you think it's worth? Here they discover it is desirable. Well, there's an understatement. It's of great worth. Well, how much? Can we quantify that? Well, how about... Uh, one month journey, give or take. How about two near-death experiences? How about some conflict within the family? How about loss of all possessions? A major beating? An angelic intervention? A haunting death? Was it worth it, Nephi? And to his dying day, he would say, yes, it was. It's worth it to obey. It's worth it to obtain scripture and allow the Lord to continue to teach us through his words. In some ways, we are left, rest, we've got a lot to wrestle with by the time we're done with this first week of Book of Mormon study. We've got to wrestle with how do we respond to prophetic words? Do I, how do I continue my lessons from the Lord instead of ringing the bell early? How do I navigate family life when people come just wired differently? How am I going to come to know God for what he's really like? Will I obey, come what may? And what will I do with God's word? I've still got 50 weeks ahead of me studying this year, so Will I consider it wisdom in God that I carry the Book of Mormon with me in my journey through life's wilderness? That's something worth holding on to every step of the way. I testify of that, my friends. And I pray that we can prove to God, however he asks us to, how much we value his word. We get lots of opportunities moving forward to give him that kind of proof. Now, I started a tradition in the letters of Paul. I, we'll see how this goes. Please weigh in in the, in the comments to let me know if this is something that's helpful to you. But I just wanted to leave you with some incredible one-liners. One year, I went through the Book of Mormon studying. I wanted to find at least one one-liner on every single page. A one-liner that was, oh, rich enough that you could make a whole church talk based with that one-liner as a title. Elder Maxwell used to do that all the time, and that inspired me. Um, that was a good year of scripture study as well. I'm going to give you a bunch of them. And maybe as we try to aim for shorter lessons, again, I failed miserably today, but uh, as we aim for shorter lessons and you have a little more time to do some fishing yourself, let me just point out some spots on the lake that are worth casting your nets. Or let me point to a few phrases in scripture that if you'll drop your line and think, and ponder, and pray, and write, and praise, and share, and everything else Lehi did in chapter 1, then you might find some treasure within as well. So, by way of review, having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days. As he read, he was filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Because thou art merciful, Thou wilt not suffer those who come unto thee that they shall perish. Plates which I have made with mine own hands. The tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty even unto the power of deliverance. We'll come back to that one next week, I promise. He was obedient unto the word of the Lord. Therefore, he did as the Lord commanded him continually running into the fountain of all righteousness. 
firm and steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of the Lord. They did murmur because they knew not the dealings of that God who had created them. Blessed art thou because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently with lowliness of heart. I have not required it of them, but it is a commandment of the Lord. I will go and do the things which the Lord hath commanded. The Lord giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them. As the Lord liveth, we will not go down. It is wisdom in God that we should obtain these records. Let us be strong like unto Moses. Wherefore can ye doubt? And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. It is better that one man should perish than that a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. I did obey the voice of the Spirit. When Zoram had made an oath unto us, our fears did cease concerning him. If I had not seen the things of God in a vision, I should not have known the goodness of God. I know that the Lord will deliver my sons and bring them down again unto us. And we had obtained the records which the Lord had commanded us and searched them and found that they were desirable, yea, even of great worth unto us. Wherefore, it was wisdom in the Lord that we should carry them with us as we journeyed in the wilderness toward the land of promise. My dear friends, I am honored to join you on this journey as we aim for our Father, as we wend our way through the wilderness, knowing that there's a promised land ahead. I testify that these words are worth everything. It is wisdom in God that we bring them with us. And so thank you for joining me thus far. And prepare yourself for yet many lessons ahead. Because a God who expects big things of us will provide ways for us to accomplish all that he has in mind. You can bank on that. He said so. <laughs>